Welcome to the Film Analysis, today with Becoming Karl Lagerfeld by Jerome Sall and Audrey Estrugo. For the moment, I'm not fucking, I'm talking to you. Well, I can have exactly the same satisfaction as if I were fucking. Psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan once said this to his students in a lecture. Karl Lagerfeld, having refused to undergo psychoanalysis throughout his life, would have liked this sentence. Unfortunately, the makers of the six-part Disney Plus series do not understand this. Lacan wanted to express that sublimation does not mean that you are only served a lukewarm substitute for the real thing but that sublimation itself can give you the same satisfaction. The series portrays Lagerfeld here as someone who has a problem with physical closeness, with sex, hence a sad figure. He then sublimates everything into his fashion. But this is only shown as a substitute, not as the actual satisfaction. The most obvious problem with this series is Daniel Brühl who looks about as much like Karl Lagerfeld as Donatella Versace. The fact that he speaks at a brisk pace and has learned a few Lagerfeld quirks doesn't save the project. We can only guess the special mixture of grandeur, esprit and irony having characterized Lagerfeld in the 70s. It's not fashion, it's like hand-knitted woolen socks. Brühl alone is not to blame for this. The series makers are to blame for this five-hour tale of woe that is unwilling to understand its protagonist. The series wants to give us a look through the keyhole. What was this man who later became a logo really like? The series answered like the child in Christian Andersen's fairy tale by simply exclaiming, the emperor is naked. The creators have obviously never thought about the nature of fashion. As a result, we do see Lagerfeld doing a few quick fashion sketches from time to time, but what we don't get to see is how he is inspired, what he reads, how he conceptualizes a collection. The series tells the story of a decade in Lagerfeld's life when Yves Saint Laurent had long been the biggest star in Paris in the 1970s, but but Lagerfeld was not yet designing haute couture, instead describing himself as a mercenary of pret a -Poté. He mainly designed for Fendi and Chloé. The series finds its conclusion with Chanel's offer in the early 80s. In the 70s, Lagerfeld also meets the aristocratic bon vivant Jacques de Bachère. This is the great love, but it never became physical. At least that's what they say. Soon, de Bachère would be making love with Lagerfeld's rival Saint Laurent, taking drugs and turning every night into an excess. But Lagerfeld keeps his distance. He drinks Coca-Cola light, goes to bed at 10 o'clock and lives with his mom. However, we are not shown in this series how there must have been an intimacy between the two. They stayed together for two decades. All we see here is Lagerfeld who worked hard on his career, who didn't wear a pigtail at first and who didn't wear sunglasses to hide his eyes. Lagerfeld's life was certainly characterized by loneliness, but the series pretends that it was a sad life. It fails to realize that Lagerfeld drew his his pleasure from work, from designing visions, from success, whilst Jacques and Yves must keep increasing their intoxication and thus fall deeper and deeper into the abyss, Lagerfeld becomes intoxicated in other ways. The series shows a bitter-looking man gorging himself on cream cakes at lightning speed out of frustration, coupled with the usual Disney prudery. If the liberated sex of the 70s is glorified as desirable, then it should at least be shown in all its explicitness for once. However, the series only briefly hints at something and then quickly draws the curtain on prudery. 
step by step, we watch Lagerfeld become the Lagerfeld we all remember. An interesting project because a film or series is always about becoming someone else, about actors becoming characters. And here we now have someone creating his own character. You could do an incredible amount with that in film, allowing for experiments, but there's nothing to see. You also waste so many good moments by simply cutting the film and moving on. For example, we are briefly shown how Lagerfeld wore corsets in the 70s because he wasn't happy with his figure. We see him putting insoles in his shoes, rendering him taller and how he also hides his age or at least lies about it. You could playfully work with this self-creation, but the series simply considers Lagerfeld to have problems. This becomes particularly clear when we miss the opportunity to set in motion a real philosophy about being and appearances. Namely, when Marlene Dietrich commissions Lagerfeld to tailor a trouser suit for her and they meet. She is over 70 and has only one wish. She doesn't want to look like an old woman dressed up as Marlene Dietrich. Here we can already see where appearances may no longer be maintained. You could do a wonderful job with it. Instead, we see a bit of the cheap tabloid theater. The gap between who you are and who you want to be is always presented as a problem. But fashion gives you the opportunity to become someone else. Karl confesses to Marlene, I hide myself every day. And that's a good sentence to think about. Or rather, you could ask yourself whether Lagerfeld would really have said this sentence. Is it really that he wants to be hidden? Or is it not that he is exposing himself by hiding? Lagerfeld then says, when asked by his mother when Marlene what Marlene Dietrich is like, he says she's great, but she doesn't know anymore. There are a few good sentences, but nothing more is done with them. It doesn't show what it means when you see yourself as a puppet, as Lagerfeld did. In other words, when you are prepared to transform yourself and not only not to externalize this inner psychological aspect, but to cast it off. At the same time as Lagerfeld is experiencing his rise, we have two philosophers particularly important in France, namely Roland Barthes and Michel Foucault. They both write about the death of the subject. In a way, Karl Lagerfeld radically puts these post-structuralist theories into practice by crossing himself out as an individual and becoming this brand. But while Lagerfeld entertains a playful approach, the series remains terribly serious. Lagerfeld's mother is also said to have been a grand dame with wit. Here it's more like the pet dragon. The precocity of the fashion world, uh, celebration of madness, the attempt to escape from what is called everyday life. This is not understood here as utopia. The series lacks lightness. And we certainly find the problem of contemporary biopics here once again in Nietzsche. They take a Jane Doe perspective. Everyone who isn't like Dick and Harry is subsequently turned into one. We don't really have diversity today. Even though there is so much talk about diversity, diversity is only allowed if people are subordinated to the absolute mainstream and are not remarkable or outstanding in any way. They are supposed to constantly utter hackneyed phrases. Stars today mainly appear to talk about their mental health problems and no longer about an outstanding album or a great film. In a few decades, we'll be making biopics about these stars. And then we should turn the whole thing around. You must show these people in private as incredibly funny, cheerful people who love life and then play these depressive characters for the public repeatedly. 
Friedrich Nietzsche was a particularly important philosopher to Lagerfeld. And Lagerfeld not only collected a lot of books, but he was also well read. Incidentally, the series doesn't show us any of that either. Nietzsche writes something remarkably interesting in Twilight of the Idols, namely tracing something unknown back to something known relieves, reassures and satisfies. Also gives a feeling of power, danger, anxiety, worry accompany the unknown. The first instinct is to get rid of these embarrassing situations. First principle, any explanation is better than none. Because it is just a matter of wanting to get rid of oppressive ideas, one is not extremely strict about the means of getting rid of them." End of quote. Lagerfeld is such an unknown and you now attribute it to something known. He has problem with sex and has eating disorders. And then the problem you have when you are faced with the unknown is contained. Lagerfeld was certainly addicted to rest and he was also lonely and he also had problems with sex, but the makers miss sex even more than Lagerfeld because the fact that he was the one who not only collected erotic photographs, but also took them himself doesn't seem to enter their brains. He saw dressing someone as something erotic. Sexuality doesn't just mean penetration, it can mean so much more. But the series lack this very aspect. Jacques de Bachea could also be said uh, to be an artist without the work and a self-destructive artist. And it doesn't achieve the depth that the series aims to create. And this depth doesn't even exist. De Bachea and Lagerfeld are united by their play with the surface. Nietzsche writes in Twilight of the Idols, but Heraclitus will always be right that being is an empty fiction. The apparent world is the only one. The real world is but a lie. End of quote. To decide in favor of appearances, that's the step you must take to go into fashion or to make a series about fashion. The valet's perspective taken here could be hastily compared to the perspective in Ridley Scott's Napoleon film. It is also about showing that, well, Napoleon was only human. That's also banal, it's a banal statement, but in Scott's film it also served a purpose. He wanted to undermine the ideology of patriotism. But what is the purpose of becoming Karl Lagerfeld? It's also not about deconstructing the 70s. Rather, all the cliches associated with the 70s are brought together once again, even if some anachronisms arise in the process. For example, the song Yes Sir, I Can Boogie plays four years too early. Even Lagerfeld's intrigues are staged in such a bourgeois manner that you completely forget you are in Paris, uh, in the fashion world, following in the footsteps of Moliere. This could have shown the pleasure of intrigue, schadenfreude, and the embarrassment of fame-seeking. In the series, it doesn't look like the world of haute couture, but more like the local branch of the Conservative Party. Lagerfeld had every opportunity. He was extremely privileged from birth, and he chose this fate himself. That's exactly what he wanted. But the series creators only went on their own initiative and made an insignificant series. They could have thought about what it means to put on a mask. Someone who had already thought about this a few decades earlier was Helmut Plessner in the book The Limits of Community. He says the individual if he wants to go public, must first give himself a form in which he becomes unassailable, an armor, 
as it were, with which it enters the battlefield of the public. To go into public without unreal compensation of a form is too great a risk. With this unreal compensation, however, man masks himself. He renounces being noticed and respected as an individuality to be representative and respected at least in a representative sense, in a special function. End of quote. In other words, as soon as we go out in public, we must take on roles. Even though there is still a strong opposition between appearance and reality, however, we can ask Nietzsche and others, including Lagerfeld himself, whether this distinction is even necessary or whether we can become this role. Yes, the mask we put on is the true face. And mask also means persona. Plesner writes, Man generalizes and objectifies himself through a mask, behind which he becomes invisible without completely disappearing as a person. End of quote. Hence, the mask may express one's personality, but what it's about here is the unrealization of one's own person. And Lagerfeld is saying that the world shouldn't be the way it is, not to be satisfied with the fact that this is how you live, but that you build your own dream castles to be able to live in them. A series that has ambitions could start to play with this. It's also about the nimbus. And this nimbus that Lagerfeld enjoyed is one that has to do with concealment. Plesner writes, the original but vulnerable indestructible nimbus, which is given in the Noli Me Tangere character of everything psychological, is replaced by an indestructible nimbus through the unrealization of the person which solves the riddle of making a person maximally visible and concealing them at the same time." End of quote. Making Visible and concealing is precisely the essence of fashion and is what Lagerfeld does. In some senses, in some scenes uh, in the series, it becomes apparent when he takes immense pleasure in dressing Jacques de Bachea rather than undressing him. And that could be rendered productively. You could create a wonderful film about the nature of covering and disguising. But in fact, the series creators are not prepared to do this. The work that Lagerfeld created barely features in this series. Apart from a few quickly scurried sketches, we see almost nothing. But the work is the decisive factor. Hence, it no longer concerns the functional masks that you have in public roles. It's about much more. Plesner writes, the work alone can become the true face of a man, for it does not reflect his mere being, the res residue, as it were, of his existence, but transfigures it in the light of his possibilities, his hidden desires, and never revealed nature." End of quote. It is true that Lagerfeld did not have one style, like his competitor Yves Saint Laurent. But the question arises when he was able to adopt so many assorted styles and create something of his own, how many faces did this man possess? In the series, we only see one, namely a very gloomy one. The work is virtually absent from this series. And it's not just the series that suffers from this. It's the disease of all biopics. They show people who have achieved wonderful things. But at the end of the day, people are interested in whether they always turned up for lunch on time. Most biopics don't honor the work. They strive to destroy it so that we watch but don't see. It would be nice if you would like to support the film analysis financially. You can do so via my bank account or PayPal. Also, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you very much.